welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to five player game, Villagers, designed by Hakun Gorder and published by Sinister Fish Games, who helped sponsor this video. After the Great Plague, your fledgling farm is the perfect place to start a new village. And if you can bring the right people together, it's also certain to be the most prosperous. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, find the six villagers with this road sign in their bottom right hand corner. And the box has dividers to separate the various components like these, which will help you to find them when you're setting up. Place the starting villagers in an area called the road and put them in a line, but their order doesn't matter. Now collect all the cards from this area. And if you're playing with four or five players, also collect all the cards from here. We're going to be setting up a two or three player game, so we'll leave them in the box. Shuffle what you took and then deal them into six face down stacks above the road, with each stack containing a number of cards equal to the number of players times two, so in this case, four each. And when you're done, it should look something like this. Set any of the undealt cards nearby in a deck called the reserve, and then find the first and second market cards and place them on the bottoms of the second and the very last deck like this. Next, find the decks of Hayers, Lumberjacks, and Miners, known as the basic villagers, which you'll set nearby, along with the gold referred to as the bank. And each side of these cards is the same except for the illustration, so either side can be face up. Each player is now given one of these founders, a village square, and a player reference that they'll place in front of themselves. And your founder card should be on the side with the two gold symbol here face up. Also collect eight gold from the bank, putting it into a personal supply, and from the reserve, deal each player five cards, which they'll keep secret, but they can examine themselves. And then, give the first player card to the person who's lived in the same place the longest, or just decide randomly. And that's the setup. In Villagers, players will be creating a village to attract new people into it, many of which will have special skills, and some of them will also have requirements that you'll need to meet before they'll join you. And as your village grows, you'll be able to generate more money, and at the end of the game, the player with the most wealth will win. The game is played over a series of rounds broken into two phases each, starting with the draft phase. First, each player determines their personal drafting limit, which is always two, plus the number of these food symbols showing on cards in their village. Now, at the beginning of the game, your drafting limit would just be two because you won't have any of these symbols. But later, if these were actually in my village, then I would have a drafting limit of four. Just be aware you can never exceed a draft limit of five, no matter how many of these symbols that you have. With their drafting limits established, the first player goes first, drafting, which means taking, any one of the face-up villagers or any one of the top face-down ones here. Now, although you won't know specifically which villagers these are, the symbols on the back will give you some idea once you begin to know the cards a little better. For example, the ones labeled with grapes on the back will either be the Vinter, Wine Trader, or Graper. Now once you've picked the card that you do wish to take, you'll put it here on your village square. Placing each villager you collect on this square, rather than directly into your hand, ensures that you don't forget how many you've taken. This is important to ensure you don't go over your draft limit. Now if the card you claimed was one of these face-up ones, you immediately replace it by flipping the top card of the leftmost deck of this top row. Now if there were no cards here at all, then you would draw the replacement from the reserve. And if this was also empty, then you would just not replace the card that you took. Over time, the piles on this top row will become emptied, and an empty pile is no longer considered to be in the game. And if either the second or last stack here is gone, then you'll turn the market card found on the bottom sideways, but leaving it in place. Players cannot take these, but we'll see how they're used a little bit later. In later rounds, there may be coins on some of the cards in this bottom row, and if you pick one like that, then you take the card as usual, but also the coins which you'll place in your personal supply. Once one player has drafted a villager, the next player in clockwise order does so as well, and you'll go around and around the table like this, and when a player has reached their drafting limit, they'll stop, while other players not at their limit will continue to draw. After all the players have finished taking as many villagers as they are owed, you'll update the road. This is done in two different ways depending on the number of players, and these are summarized on this card here, but I'll walk you through how each of these methods work. If you have any more than two players, first check for any face-up villagers with coins on them. In the first round, there won't be any, but let's pretend that there were. 
You'll now discard these cards, returning that money back to the bank, and these you'll put into a shared discard pile. You'll now deal new ones to replace them from the reserve. And if the reserve is ever empty, deal from the leftmost pile of the road. If these cards are all gone as well, deal no replacements. But then, no matter the situation, you'll place one coin on each face-up villager. In this way, at the end of the round, any of these cards that were not taken will then be discarded, as we just saw. If you have only two players, as we set up in this video, it's done a little differently. First, each player in reverse turn order may, if they like, take one gold from the bank and place it on any villager of the road, even if that villager already has gold on it. Once all players who wish to do this have had a chance to, you'll then discard all villagers who do not have coins on them. And then you'll deal new ones from the reserve into those spaces. Now, if there are not enough cards in the reserve to fill all the required spaces in, then as before, you will deal from the leftmost face-down stack of the road. And if all of those cards are gone, then no replacements would be dealt. With the road completed, players will now collect the cards they drafted, adding them to their hand. And then you'll move on to the build phase. Here, each player first needs to determine their build limit. This is two plus the number of these build symbols that you'll find among your face-up villagers. Now, we won't have any of those in the first round, but if later in the game I had these cards out, then I would currently have a build limit of two plus two more, or a total of four. And no matter how many of these symbols you have, at most your maximum build limit is five, just like the draft limit. Also like the draft limit, this phase is performed in turns, starting again with the first player and then going clockwise around the table. However, unlike the draft limit, here, when it's a player's turn, they'll perform all of their build actions at once, and then the next player goes, meaning you'll just go once around the table. Also, unlike the draft phase, you don't have to build as many as your maximum. You can build less than that if you wish to. You'll start by declaring your build limit, which again, in this case, is two, and then you'll put a number of villagers up to that amount that you intend to play onto this village square. And again, this just ensures that you don't go over your limit on your turn. Now you will play those cards into your village area. And if a card has a banner right here at the top, then it means they can be played into your village directly with no other requirements. But if you see one of these production chains here, directly above its name, then that means you need to place the card on top of the one listed before it. For example, this cart right can't be played until you have a wheeler in play. And the wheeler can't be played until you have a lumberjack in play. Lumberjacks, you might remember, are one of the three types of basic villagers that have their own decks that we placed on the table during the setup. During the build phase, up to three times, you can take basic villagers, and they can be the same or different ones, and these do not count against your build limit. Instead, you pay for each basic villager you wish to take by discarding any card from your hand face down onto any one of the top row stacks that still have cards. Now, if there were no stacks left, you would return the card to the top of the reserve instead. Either way, you then take the basic villager that you want and add it directly to your village. And again, this does not count against your build limit. So I had a build limit of two. I placed this Wattler, which used up one of it. This didn't count against it at all, so I can still build one more thing. Now that I have this Lumberjack, I can place the Wheeler that I selected for this build phase that says it needs a Lumberjack before it can be played. And when a card is part of a production chain, you always place the next card in the chain on top of the one before it. And make sure that you place it so it's covering up everything below its name. This means that any other symbols the card had on it would no longer be valid, and we'll learn the importance of these various types of symbols a little bit later. Also notice the symbols here in the top right-hand corner these will either show one or two cards. If it shows two, then it means that it can actually have two cards placed directly on it when forming a production chain. So if I had another card that required a lumberjack, it could also use this as a foundation. I would just slide the first card over like this and place them so that there's room for both. In this way, I've created two different production chains. This one doesn't show any symbol here because we're at the end of this production chain and nothing else can go on top. The wheeler can have one card placed on it, and that's the cart right. So if I was building that later, I would place it like this. Sometimes you'll want to play a villager, but it has a padlock symbol here, meaning that it must be unlocked as it's played. But it will also show the name of another villager right here. If you have that villager already in your village, even if you just placed it that turn, you take two gold from the bank, put it on that worker, and then add the padlocked card to your village. Again, assuming you have any other cards that are necessary. Like in this case, I would need a hare. 
Adding coins like this to your own cards is good, and we'll see why a little bit later. And a villager like this will show a key ring symbol to remind you that it can unlock certain cards for you. And the value that you see inside of there, two in this case, is the number of cards in the game that could potentially be unlocked by it, meaning it could, at most, accumulate four gold here. If I didn't have this required villager, the Cartwright, but another player did, I could still play this peddler, but instead, I would have to pay two gold from my personal supply and place it on that worker, and then I'd be able to play this peddler. The two gold that is now on this Cartwright will benefit my opponent and not me. But this might still be worth doing if I really want to play this peddler. Now, it's also possible that I won't have the Cartwright and neither will my opponent. Don't worry, you can still play a padlocked card like this. Instead, though, you'll pay the two gold from your supply and put it directly into the bank. But the only time you can choose to pay the bank to unlock a padlocked card is if you or your opponent doesn't have the required card in play. During the build phase, you can also play special villagers, which will have this banner and color at the top. And these will have a special effect, which is described on them and is resolved when played. If there's an X symbol here, and after following the instructions of the card, it is discarded. On the other hand, some special villagers don't have a discard symbol here. And in those cases, they do count against your building limit and should be placed on your village square at the start of this phase. And those are all the types of actions you can perform during the build phase. And once the first player has performed all the actions they want to, then the next player in clockwise order goes, and you'll continue like that once around the table. Now check to see if any player has a village with no food symbols in it. If so, they must flip their Founder's card to this side, and it must stay like that for the rest of the game. No effect can cause it to flip back over to the side that showed gold. Then, after checking for this food symbol requirement, the first player card is passed to the left, and a new round begins. Unless a market phase needs to be resolved, in which case that happens now, before the new round starts. The first time a market phase would happen, is if the first market card has been revealed and the pile to its left has been depleted. In other words, if it was revealed but there were still cards here, you would not resolve this phase, you would just move on to the next round. On the other hand, if this was gone, then after the build phase of that round, you would stop and resolve this first market phase. Here, each player looks at the cards in their village and counts the total value of any numbers inside of these gold symbols, ignoring any values inside of silver circles. Then, you add to that gold value the total value of all actual coins sitting on your cards. You leave the coins there, just add their values to your total. So in this case, we would have 9 plus 4 for a total of 13. And then you take that final total value in coins from the bank and add it to your personal supply. That ends the first market, and then you'll remove this card from the game and begin a new round. The second market phase is only resolved at the end of a round, where all of the cards from this top row are gone, and this one has been revealed. And resolving the second market phase works much like the first market. Now, this is a simpler village than you will likely have in front of you when it's time to score the second market. But this will still allow me to illustrate all the required rules. First, you'll total the value of the numbers in all of the gold circles as we did before. So in this case, 17. And then you'll add to that the values from these silver circles. So this says, I get three for every two of these symbols I have. And I have two symbols right here. So adding that three to my 17 would give me 20 gold, which I'll collect from the bank. When silver scores you values based on colored banners or symbols or even padlocks in your village, you do include covered cards in those cases because the banners and padlocks are still visible. Now, rather than totaling the value of gold that you have on your cards and taking that amount from the bank, you can just take these coins directly off the cards and add them to your personal supply. The game is now over, and the player with the most gold wins. If there's a tie, the tied player with the fewest villagers is the winner. And if there's still a tie, the tied players share the victory. And that's how you play villagers. There are also rules and included components for playing solo, but I'll leave those for you to discover on your own. That said, if you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the game's page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. And if you found this helpful, consider liking and subscribing and clicking that little bell icon so you get notifications anytime we post a new video. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.